This is the first time we've used this room. I gotta say, I really kind of like it compared. Not not that we don't like our rooms. Sometimes we cross the LBJ School, but. Um, I'm awfully grateful to the Briscoe Center, and if you've not spent time in Briscoe before, if this is your first time conducting the, this middle wing of Sid Richardson Hall, um, it's amazing. The collection of archive materials of Americana, uh, original notes, handwritten stuff from generals in the Civil War, to, to some great uh, modern era Texans, political figures, journalism figures, it's just incredible. So I recommend you find some time to add this to your list along with uh, the many other sort of uh, archive and museum type things that pepper our campus. I should introduce myself. Uh, who is this guy from Briscoe? It's just trying to sell this. Uh, I'm from Briscoe. I have, no, I have no investment in it. I'm Bobby Chesney. I'm the director of the Strauss Center for International Security and Law and your, and your host today. Um, the Strauss Center, I know many familiar faces in the audience don't need to hear this, but for those who aren't familiar with us, we're a university-wide interdisciplinary unit of the University of Texas. And the whole idea of the Strauss Center is that we can explore things that relate in some way to international affairs, security, the, the whole complex set of global issues we deal with today. We can do it in a cross-disciplinary way, taking on course initiatives, uh, research topics, public events that wouldn't necessarily fit squarely and therefore come out of any one individual unit on campus. We're physically based at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, of course, and, and the LBJ School is, is very much uh, the, the the most attuned to what we do since we are very policy focused. Uh, some of our, we have about a dozen programs. One of our major programs is focused on cybersecurity and all its complexities. And then one of our newest programs is a partnership with UT's uh, Journalism School. We're really excited about it, the Journalism and World Affairs Program. A coincidence, that acronym does in fact spell JAWA. I like that a lot, I gotta say. Um, but this, this is really fun because it, it answers an increasingly important, or it speaks to an increasingly important facet of journalism today. Um, journalists need to have a good understanding of the full array of, of technical issues, international relation issues, the intersections of these issues. We have a lot of amazing faculty and students over at the Moody School who are expert in this, and so it was a natural partnership for us. Um, and we, we cast about thinking, what will we actually do with this program? We then thought, well, what would be really neat would be to craft a, a, uh, a highly, uh, I guess what I want to say is we, we were casting about for different types of programs, and entities like the Strauss Center can do lots of different things. The thing we thought would be most impactful would be to bring the best and brightest of actual journalism who work in these areas to come do a short residency to be able to mix it up with our students on a sustained basis for several days and give a public talk. This is the first one. This is the inaugural presentation and the inaugural holder of the distinguished visiting journalist position that this partnership has created. And I could not be more pleased, and I don't think we could find anyone who'd be a better suited honoree than Nicole Perroth of the New York Times. You all, if you're acknowledged in this area, whether you realize it or not, you've read her work. It's deeply influential. She's a go-to journalist on this topic. Uh, her work has been optioned for movies and films. I'm like, wow, that is absolutely amazing. She's just completing her manuscript of a forthcoming book. I believe the title is, This is How They Tell Me the World Ends. Very yeah. yeah, very happy. It's a happy tale of, of cyber madness. Um, you are going to want to pre-order this. Um, I could go on and on. She's she's won innumerable awards. Um, but I think the chair on top of all that is she's just really fun and interesting to be around. We got to spend a little time together. And I knew I was impressed with your work, but I was I was even more impressed with you as a person. It's been really fun to get to spend this time with you, and I'm really glad now that our, our friends who came out today are going to get that same chance. So, Nicole, thanks for being our inaugural honoree. Thank you. So, I just want to say thank you to Professor Chesney, thank you to everyone for coming, and thank you for the wonderful hospitality at UT this week. I have been so impressed with the quality and caliber of the students I've met. Um, I went and had the chance to sit in on a couple classes, and I wanted to take them. I took one, um, or sat in on one, in data privacy, and they were just learning the very basics of security and coding, and I'm, I have ideas for maybe coming back and, and bringing some of my competitors in cybersecurity to learn the basics of that. Um, <laughs> the, 
just quality of the questions I've received this week. I mean, I sat in on a class for Lion Deception yesterday, and afterwards the students came up, and, and usually the, the questions I get are, have I been hacked? I think, you know, my grandma's asking me if she's been hacked. And, but these kids were asking me about quantum computing, and they were telling me about divisions of the National Security Agency I had never even heard of, <laughs> and sonar attacks. So it's been, it's been a really enlightening week. So this is my icebreaker slide here. So this is me right before I joined the New York Times. <laughs> glowing skin, this is 2010, glowing skin, well rested, friends, had friends, everything's great. <laughs> this is me, you know, 10 years later today, you know, exhausted, stayed up the other night, all night covering the Iowa, Iowa caucus di disaster, and I'm also fairly convinced Emirati intelligence is in my computer. <laughs> so I just wanted to walk you all through the last 10 years of my work, because I think that cy cybersecurity is just, it's in the news every day, we talk about it in policy circles, and I, um, I just wanted to get back to basics a little bit and explain sort of my own education when it came to cyber and the threat landscape because I think it's really helpful in thinking through some of these policy solutions because it's, a, it's not an easy topic. So common questions, like I said, are, you know, have I been hacked? And the answer is yes, you've all been hacked. Um, and the other question I get is, you know, you're not technical. What's your technical background? What, why are you the one covering cybersecurity at the New York Times? And that's a great question. Uh, when, I, when I joined the New York Times, or at least when I interviewed, um, I told the New York Times this. I'm not technical. I had come from Forbes magazine. I'd been covering venture capital. I'd been covering web startups. And the New York Times had called me and they said, you know, we're looking at you for this job, but we're not sure you're going to want it. If you're the New York Times, I'll probably just take whatever it is. How bad, how bad could it be? And I said, it's cybersecurity. This was 10 years ago. Not only did I not know anything about cybersecurity, I actively avoided learning anything about cybersecurity. And throughout the interview process, I kept telling the interviewer, I know this person over here and this person over there who are much more qualified and have been covering cybersecurity for years. You think you might want to meet with them first. And they said, well, to be honest, we've met with all of them and we have no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> and we need someone to come in and translate this for our New York Times readers. And so I was hired and I think I brought the readers through my own education in cybersecurity. So this was one of the first stories I did. Um, I, the first thing I did when I got to the New York Times was I asked around who are who are the hackers, not you know, the bad hacker, the black hats, but who are the white hat hackers? Who are the people who really know their stuff, who really know the coding, who really know the technical elements, and can really like walk me around and show me what I need to know on this beat? And the guy I met was this guy on the right, H.D. Moore. He's famous for making things that break things, I guess is the simplest way to put it. He made something called Metasploit, which is a coding framework that you can use to test the security of any systems. It takes every known vulnerability on Earth and it fires them at a computer system. And if you have it patched or you have a misconfiguration somewhere, it'll get inside. So he really knows his stuff. And so he started walking me through the basics of, of the threat landscape and he said, you know, what I really think you should cover is video conferencing systems. Okay? So he said, I can get into any boardroom, hospital, uh, government agency in the world through their video conferencing system. So I said, okay, show me how. So uh, we set up a web connection and he showed me that yes, indeed, a lot of people have uh, video conferencing systems set up by Cisco, I think the other big one, if I, if I remember correctly, was Polycom. And a lot of people aren't configuring them behind the firewall or they're not setting up passwords to access these systems. So you can just go on the open internet and basically hop inside any of these video conferencing systems. And they're so high def that you can zoom in 
on anything sitting on the table. So venture capital firms, we were able to zoom in and read term sheets sitting on the table. Law firms, um, <coughs> at one point I actually asked them to zoom out the window across the parking lot to like we, where we could see a squirrel burrowing <laughs> acorns in the dirt. Mm -hmm. And then he said, okay, now I want to teach you one other thing, which is even if you have set up your system behind the firewall, if you regularly communicate or video conference with someone else that has not done that, you can leapfrog from that vulnerable system into the more secure system. So we went to one of these open video conferencing systems and it was a law firm, and we looked at what I would call their speed dial of most frequently uh, contacted boardrooms or, or clients. The number one listing was Goldman Sachs boardroom. So at that point we could have hopped into the Goldman Sachs boardroom. Now, for reasons that are fairly obvious, we did not do that. <laughs> and But I included this line in the story. I said, you know, he even found a path into the Goldman Sachs boardroom. I immediately got a call after publication from Goldman Sachs, who <laughs> were not happy about this. And they said, we're not going to ask you for correction, but we don't think this is true. And, you know, we're not going to ask you for correction, but we don't think this is true. So, it really kept me up at night. Like, what, what is this? Like, who is this HD Moore guy? And what, what were we doing? And he and I really trust him. And was that the Goldman Sachs boardroom? Or what was it? Anyways, I was panicked until a couple weeks later, I was at a dinner, and the guy next to me said, I specifically asked to sit next to you, Nicole. So I thank you, because after your video conferencing story, Goldman Sachs panicked got rid of all their video conferencing systems and brought my company in. We do secure video conferencing. <laughs> <laughs> completely replaced all their systems and now they're our biggest client and we're just able to raise our Series B. But, <laughs> so I like to point to this. I like to point to this slide first and this story first because it was just my own, my very quick education in how vulnerable American systems are, how vulnerable we are to espionage in particular, um, but also how in denial a lot of companies and, and even Goldman Sachs in this case were about how powerful these vulnerabilities were. Uh, from there, I learned that it's not just video conferencing systems. There was a, a major hack at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I'm bothered by this comment as a journalist. <laughs> um, I, I, there was a major hack at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Even after the FBI came and swept their systems and, and thought that they had got, the, 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 in this case it was Chinese hackers, out of their systems, they found out that later a thermostat in one of their corporate apartments was still communicating with an IP address in China. Um, one day the printer started reaming out uh, documents in Mandarin and they found <laughs> that they were still in their printer. And um, one of my favorites was, let's see if I have a slide. One of my favorites was, uh, let's see if I have it now. There was one case they wrote about where uh, a, a group of Chinese hackers had tried to get into a major, let's say, major oil company in Texas. Uh, they weren't able to get in. Actually, the, the company systems were fairly hard in. So what did they do? They went and researched the employees at the oil firm and saw what they all had in common on Facebook, and they all had liked the same Chinese uh, takeout restaurant near their offices, and so they infected the PDF takeout menu so whenever they would go and order food and they downloaded or clicked on this PDF takeout menu, they got in that way. So, you know, fairly quickly I'm learning that things are not pretty in cybersecurity land. This is uh, Mike McConnell, and he, he told me, you know, in looking at computer systems of con consequence, in government, Congress, at the Department of Defense, aerospace, companies with valuable trade secrets, we have not examined one yet that has not been infected by an advanced persistent threat, which is code name for, uh, in many cases, uh, nation state hacking groups. So, um, <laughs> a lot of this felt very theoretical until I started covering these attacks where, yes, they, the, the hackers had gotten in through these systems. So a big one was Target. You know how they got into Target? They got into <coughs> their HVAC vendor, their heating and, and cooling system. 
Um, so I did a lot of this, and, and there was one thing that security researchers kept telling me over and over again, which was there's only two types of companies left in the United States, companies that have been hacked and companies that don't know they've been hacked yet. And I, I found my job is to go out and see, like, is this really true? Okay, so my biggest education in this was when Chinese, the Chinese military hacked the New York Times. And I actually embedded with our security team and incident responders at Mandiant and the FBI for four months as we watched the guy who was, we called affectionately, the Beijing summer intern, would roll into our network at 9 a.m. Beijing time and roll out at 5 p.m. Beijing time. And I, this was truly the, the best education I could have had in, in terms of cyber threats. And at the very end of it, the New York Times graciously allowed me to publish everything we knew. And I remember the night before we hit publish, the Times said, wait a second, what are our competitors going to say about this? And I said, they're not going to say anything because chances are they've been hacked too. <laughs> Lo and behold, we published the story. The Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, all raised their hands and said, we were hacked too, we were hacked too. It was like, you weren't cool unless you were hacked. <laughs> and then very soon after that, we um, ended up working with Mandiant, who we had worked with on our own attack, to publish this story about the actual building um, that uh, Unit 61398 of the People's Liberation Army amazing that I've memorized that, but I've talked about them so much over the years. We talked about the actual building that they were housed in and that a New York Times was hardly alone. They've, they've been hacking thousands of hackers from that building. And I think this was a story that really had the greatest impact early in my time at the Times because so many companies were getting hacked by that point, but there was sort of this um, fear that by coming forward it would affect their stock price or it would put a big scarlet letter on their forehead and after we came out and said this has happened to us, it really opened the floodgates for us to talk about uh, Chinese cyber espionage, the extent of, of Chinese cyber espionage, and uh, for the to put pressure on the Obama administration to really come up with a solution to this problem. They have been calling out the problem for a very long time and trying to negotiate with their uh, counterparts in China. And eventually we came to this sort of tentative truce that Bobby can probably speak to better than I can, that um, they would halt all industrial espionage. Now that, uh, under the Trump administration, that's all gone away. So we're all back, game on, lots of industrial espionage happening. Now I skipped over this slide. Um, what I learned very early on was that these vulnerabilities that, that I was writing about had real merit and value for governments. These were, and, and in this case, I'm not really talking about the video conferencing software. I'm talking about mm -hmm. um, mistakes in code that uh, we call zero days. So zero days are just you know, uh, an unpatched, unknown hole in, say, your iPhone iOS software. That if the government knew about it and they knew how to exploit it, they could get into your phone. And those zero days, nation states are buying them. Now this blew me away. This is what I ended up writing my whole book about. That there are nations out there using taxpayer dollars to go make sure that your phone or your computer system or your industrial um, infrastructure stays, stays vulnerable and mostly for espionage, that they can spy on these systems, but also potentially so that they might be able to drop a cyber weapon into those systems one day. This was a guy I met, he's an Italian hacker, and he was selling bugs in this code, but he was selling them in a very specific uh, segment of code, which was the code uh, like Siemens and Schneider Electric and General Electric systems that we attach to our nation's most critical infrastructure. And I went to dinner with him and I said, so, Luigi, who won't you sell these things to? And he said, I would love to talk to you about that, but I'd rather talk about the salmon. The salmon is delicious. And that's basically what happens when you're a reporter and you ask anyone who plays in this specific space um, who they will and won't sell to. 
there's so much silence and so much omerta around this particular trade that it's very hard to get real answers. And you know, I will say that the United States really spawned this. We were sort of the ones to really recognize the vulnerability or the value in some of these vulnerabilities for espionage. Um, but we do have a process in the United States for dealing with these. It's called the vulnerability equities process. And we engage a lot of US government agencies um, in these discussions about whether we will keep the vulnerability for espionage or potentially some future cyber attack or whether we'll turn them over to the software hardware vendor for patching. So I'm, I'm gonna come back to this, but this was a very early story I did in this when we learned that it actually wasn't just the United States, it was a bunch of companies playing this market. Okay, this is just my fun slide to make fun of Kevin Mandia. So he, they had come and helped us at the New York Times with our own hack. We had done the story with them, it made him a celebrity, he, they sold his company for a billion dollars, and I like to joke that he owes me 500 million. <laughs> okay. Um, I do want to point out that I was learning that, you know, the Chinese weren't the only ones doing this, and I like to bring this slide up and this story up because it gets easily forgotten in the current discussions about Huawei. So for years, we pressured um, American businesses not to work with Huawei. We told them that it was backward, that it was a Chinese spy tool, but it is important to remember the story I did with my colleague David Sanger a few years ago that we discovered that actually the National Security Agency had backdoored Huawei and were using it as a spy tool. And um, I, poor Caitlin Haig, the, the White House spokesperson who had to address the story, she said, well, <laughs> we do not give intelligence. We collect to U.S. companies to advance their international competitiveness or increase their bottom line. Many countries cannot say the same. They weren't denying that we were doing this. They were just saying China and the United States are doing this for very different reasons. All right, so this is a snapshot. I don't expect you to be able to read this. I'm just sort of pointing out that this was the declassified 2009 US National Intelligence Estimate, uh, which is the consensus view of all <coughs> of our nation's intelligence agencies about what the state of threats are to the United States. And if you look at the 2009 NIE, you'll notice barely a mention of Iran in this document. Um, I think we talk about Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, um, we don't even really mention Iran as a potential cyber threat. A lot of the attention was on Russia and China. And so in 2012, we were a little bit taken aback when Iran uh, perpetrated a cyber attack on Saudi Aramco, the world's richest oil company, uh, that to this day is the most destructive, well, at the time was the most destructive attack to date. So, what they did was they hit uh, 30,000 Aramco computers and they destroyed their data. They, they turned their computers into br bricks. You could no longer even load these computers. And then they left a little message for us behind. When the forensic uh, incident responders started digging into their malware, they realized they hadn't just wiped the data on these computers, they had replaced it with an image of a burning American flag. And I always come back to this attack, not only because it caught us um, by surprise and it, it really freaked the American intelligence community out because we had, we had grossly underestimated how quickly Iran would learn from the cyber attacks on its own systems and how quickly those would come back to haunt us. So just a couple months after that Iranco attack, they started hitting uh, American banks with something that we consider fairly low-level cyber attacks in any other case, denial of service attacks. Some people say they aren't even attacks. It's basically when a hacker floods your system with so much junk traffic that you can barely get online. So if you were paying attention to the Iowa caucuses the other day, um, you might say that they denial of service attacked themselves mm -hmm. by not <laughs> testing their reporting <laughs> systems. <laughs> so in this case, the uh, uh, Iranian hackers were doing this to American banks, but they weren't just doing any old denial of service attack. They actually had managed to hack really powerful 
data servers and then use those data servers to fire traffic at American banks. And I'm so sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to expand this one. Let's see if I can, I can actually read. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, we, we said this. Very proud of this colorful language we used. Um, you know, they transformed the online equivalent of a few yapping chihuahuas into a pack of fire breathing Godzillas. I don't know why our editor let me get away with that. <laughs> but this was effectively, they were using low level, um, in concept at least, low level attacks to take down two dozen American banks. I mean, it wasn't as if they were breaching the bank systems, but Citigroup, Bank of America, JP Morgan, you couldn't online bank for a couple months during these periods of the Iranian cyber attacks because they had successfully taken their online banking systems offline. And then <clears throat> the attack we'd all been waiting for, um, the one that we'd all long feared, the one that American intelligence officials call um, the Cyber Pearl Harbor. For years we've worried about what might happen when they use these vulnerabilities I've been covering for not espionage, but some kind of destructive attack. And that happened in February of 2014 for the very first time when uh, Iranian hackers pulled off a Saudi Aramco-esque attack on the Sands Casino in Las Vegas. They did this because Sheldon Adelson, who owns the Sands Casino, had casually mentioned during a panel talk that we should bomb nuke Iran, and they didn't like that very much. So they um, attacked Sands Casino, and they basically decimated uh, the computers at Sands Casino, and with a twist, this time they um, defaced their websites with images of Sheldon Adelson and, and Benjamin Netanyahu, and they also started publishing employee data online. And I think what's important to remember about this attack was how quickly um, each attack that I was covering was escalating, how much uh, each group was learning from the attack before it and adding a little <coughs> twist. Um, so it wasn't long after this that we saw the Sony attack. And the Sony attack effectively was the same thing as the <coughs> Iranian attack on the Sands Casino. Um, but in this case, they added another twist, which was, if you'll remember, that they dumped all the emails uh, and documents from Sony online, and they showed that you know you can do this, and the media is not going to focus on, oh my God, they just decimated tens of thousands of computers and servers at Sony. They're going to focus on, oh my God, look at the gender pay gap in Hollywood and look at what so-and-so said about Angelina Jolie and Adam Sandler movies. And if you ask me, this was the playbook for the 2016 election interference. Um, you dump those emails, the media will run to it. I will say I'm not proud of some of the coverage we had in 2016, but when this happened, we did have discussions at the New York Times about how to deal with the stolen data, and we did make a decision at the time to not cover um, the leaked documents because we did feel like we were amplifying uh, a foreign nation states, what would you even call that, propaganda? Or... So, let me just check my notes here. Um, what was happening at this point was um, Iran and North Korea in particular were learning that they're, they were never going to be able to match us militarily. They're never going to be able to match us with conventional warfare. But for the price of uh, F-16, even less, maybe half that, um, they can build up a fairly, uh, fairly strong cyber army. And because we in the United States are plugging in so many of our systems online, not just um, it, within our corporate structures, but also critical infrastructure. We're putting so many of our, our, our emails are basically a daily record of our inner thoughts these days and our, our contacts and relationships. They were finding just how weak we were in the United States when it came to defense. And these were just sort of the beginning of us seeing them use those, use those strategies to, to catch us off guard. 
so we did this story about North Korea, and, and the headline kind of says it all. The world once laughed at North Korean cyber power no more. Um, we learned that in just a couple years, um, they had developed uh, a cyber army that I think we have a number in here. I think it was something, yeah, 6,000 hackers. Many of them operating uh, from China, which made it really hard to figure out how exactly to deal with the threat. Mm -hmm. um, they were using a lot of their capabilities suddenly to fund the regime. So some of that was um, some pretty sophisticated attacks on the global banking structure. Um, they also, you know, they were using this to get around sanctions, and they were doing something called Bitcoin mining even. They were using um, infected computer systems and, and hacking some of the Bitcoin traders to basically fund the regime. And I think this was another case where it really caught us off guard that suddenly, you know, the, we can't apply more sanctions to North Korea, but they're not only able to use cyber to level the playing field, but they're use it, using it to be able to get around the sanctions. So <clears throat> what we sort of learned was that the stakes, this was only a couple years later. So this was, the dateline on this was 2018, but this was sort of the uh, culmination of a couple of attacks. So in 2012, I started getting urgent calls from people at the Department of Homeland Security saying, we're seeing a ton of attacks on our power systems, and we don't think that we're well prepared to deal with this and to defend against these attacks. And um, we don't know where they're coming from. There was some evidence they were coming from the Middle East. There was some evidence they were coming from Russia. And over the next few years, we were able to put some of this knowledge together to find out that there were Russian hacking groups that were really trying to infiltrate our power plants, and in one case, even got into um, Wolf Creek, a nuclear power plant in, in um, I think it was in Kansas. And this is where sort of the game started to change. Um, it was clear, I don't think Russian hackers at that point were looking to do us harm, but it was clear that they were doing what they call the, the Pentagon, preparing the battlefield. So in the event one day that geopolitics led us to a place of, of war, they would be so far into our power grid and into our systems that if necessary, they could pull off the kind of attack that would lead to something akin to the Northeast blackouts um, back in 2003. And this is where things started to get very real. Um, the DHS, to their credit, they, they eventually published some screenshots. And what the screenshots showed us from some of the Russian attacks was that they had the ability to shut the power off. Um, they said, you know, they, they made their way to the machines with access to the critical control system. And from what we can see, they were there. Um, all that's missing is some political motivation. <clears throat> so, I mention all this because right now we're in this very interesting predicament with our situation with Iran. So, Iran, you know, we, we've sanctioned them, um, we reached the nuclear deal, then we ripped the nuclear deal apart, or at least we pulled out of it, and then most recently with the attack on General Soleimani, uh, you know, we, we hope that the retribution has ended. Um, but if you talk to anyone who knows anything about cybersecurity these days, we're very worried about a cyber attack. So until this point, Iran has shown that they can destroy computer systems. They've shown that they can slow our banks to a crawl. Um, they've continued to pull off some of the same destructive attacks they pulled off on Saudi Aramco, on other Saudi firms in the Middle East. Um, and this was Chris Krebs, who runs the cybersecurity agency at DHS, who I think was here recently, um, in an interview telling us that they're worried that you know people didn't really understand just how vulnerable we are to an Iranian cyber attack, that they had the ability to quote, burn down the system. Um, and so I don't know what's holding them back yet, other than I think they're hoping that either 
Um, they don't want to give the Europeans a reason to also pull out of the deal. Uh, perhaps they're hopeful that uh, someone else will win the 2020 election and we'll change our minds about the nuclear deal. Um, but right now things are pretty precarious and anyone who knows anything about cybersecurity is really watching this very closely. Now I don't want to skip over the fact what I was learning about um, how other countries were using these tools. So um, a lot of these a lot of these attacks, you know, are are sort of the the purview of, of nation states with real resources and a real determination to do harm. But after uh, the Snowden documents, one of the side effects we probably don't talk about enough from the Snowden leaks was that those offered a big blueprint to other countries and the, the blueprint was wait that's what the u.s can do we want we want some of that we want to be able to spy on other countries and the countries who were saying this were countries like um, the united arab emirates and in some cases mexico where they wanted to use these tools on their own citizens so that ended up being something that has consumed a lot of my time we were discovering that this was a guy in, in the UAE that I talked to, Ahmed Mansour, who was was pretty actively talking on, on Twitter and social media about um, improving voting rights in the UAE. And this is what happened to him as a result. So he'd been jailed and fired from his job. Um, he'd had his passport confiscated. His car was stolen. His email was hacked. He had his location tracked. His bank account had been robbed and he'd been beaten up twice in the same week. And when we looked at his phone together with Citizen Lab, uh, which is a, a group at the University of Toronto to understand just how deeply he'd been hacked, we found that two commercial versions of spyware, one sold by a company in Italy and the other uh, sold by a company in, in Israel were inside his phone. And that basically showed us that governments were with that didn't have the same sort of cyber trade craft as we do here in the West. We're now easily able to buy some of that spyware and espionage capability um, from Western government, uh, sorry, Western contractors and Israeli contractors. And that instead of what we might have here in the United States, where there's very strict rules around who you can actually hack, and you know, if you ever want to hack an American, you have to go through. 10 rungs at the NSA, which I don't think kind of came out very clearly in the Snowden Lakes. In these other countries, there's no rules. And we were finding that they were using um, them on their own citizens. So I got pretty involved with this. I um, was contacted by a bunch of activists in Mexico who said, we think after some of your stories that our phones might have been infected. We've been getting a lot of weird messages some threatening messages, and he said, okay. So I put them in touch with Citizen Lab, and we started um, trying to meet with as many people as possible who got in some variation of the same message. And what we found was that um, what they had in common is that it was very odd. They were all backers of a Mexican soda tax. So we were never able to get to the bottom of it, but we did learn, you know, Coca-Cola's biggest market and the soda industry's biggest market is in Mexico. And, you know, I don't want to connect the dots too much, but someone was getting some kickback somewhere and didn't want to put this Mexican soda tax in place. And so these were not dissidents or human rights activists. These were people who were raising the issue of diabetes. Um, they were nutritional researchers. And so I did this story about, you know, this is an odd, odd target. We're finding Israeli spyware on the phones of people who just want a soda tax and to lower the incidence of diabetes in Mexico. And shortly after we did that, a bunch of people started to come forward um, saying that they had gotten these messages too. And it wasn't just this group, it was Mexican journalists and their families. It was, it was international lawyers who were investigating the disappeared students in Mexico. And um, we basically realized that um, Mexico was buying this Israeli spyware and it was using it in very corrupt ways. Um, and this story that we did actually led to um, widespread protests in Mexico and um, 
calls for investigations, but unfortunately those have, have stuttered a bit. Most recently we learned that NSO has also been selling its tools, NSO, sorry, is the Israeli group, it's been selling its tools to India, where it's also been used um, on, uh, to spy on the phones of journalists and people advocating for, um, or people who are representing those in areas of, of high conflict. And then most recently we learned, you know, it's not just it's not just governments that have to pay this large amounts of money to get into these devices. We learned a very clever twist on this recently when I got a tip um, that this app that had been on the iTunes store called Totalk. So how many of you have heard of TikTok? Okay. I got a lot of giggles this week when I asked students about TikTok. <laughs> um, this week, so we got this. We got this tip about toe talk, <coughs> talk talk. I don't even know how to how to pronounce it. Um, it was one of the most downloaded apps in the iTunes Store, and we got a tip that it was an Emirati spy tool. And so, um, when we dug in, it turned out that yes, it was an Emirati spy tool. <laughs> all the data that you were using in the app, so all your messages. All your contacts, every time you added a new contact in your phone, this app was aggressively pulling that contact back. All your calendar appointments and access to your microphone um, was all going back to this company called Owned by Dark Matter, which was an Emirati, uh, bigger story there, but I'll just leave it at an Emirati company that was in the same house in the same building as the Emirati spy services. And this was all going back to their data servers, and they were searching. Uh, for vo voices and um, keywords and all the things that you would want to do. So this blew me away because they weren't using any kind of zero day vulnerability or any kind of misconfiguration in code. They just did something very clever, which was they banned WhatsApp and other popular messaging apps from being accessible in the UAE. And then they rolled out this, this other app that sounded just like TikTok, but it was an Emirati spy tool. And they convinced people to download it, and suddenly they got everything they needed. And what was really horrifying is that this wasn't just the most downloaded app in UAE. It was really popular with Americans. I don't know why, but it was um, millions of Americans downloaded uh, this app. So we called Apple and Google and said, it turns out this app in your, your iTunes store and Google Play store are an em Emirati spy channel. And to their credit, they took it down. But it, it caused a lot of interesting debates within the tech companies who were like, we don't, we're not intelligence agencies. You know, you, Nicole Perler, at the New York Times seem to have proven your case that this is an Emirati spy tool, but what you're basically asking us to do is now go out and investigate anyone, any developer who puts an app in the app store and look not only at who they are, but who they're one degree separated from and um, to investigate you know, where, they're, where, where they're based and what, what connections they might have to nation state intelligence. And we don't know, they're still having these discussions. We don't know whether we uh, can afford to basically be in that position. So Google, um, they just put the app back in the store recently. So I'll be calling them out on that shortly. But <laughs> Apple, they're still having these discussions. And, and what Apple will say is this says a lot about Google's model. You know, they're a wild, wild west. We at, at least have the ability to vet these apps. And, um, but still, I, I, I don't know where they're going to ultimately land on this. All right, I'm, I'm include, I, I've sort of skipped over this, but I wanted to just, you know, Russia was attacking the grid. Russia was, was hacking us all over the place. And then they hacked our election, as we all know. Uh, I like to include this slide because you know, the president always asks, where's the um, server? CrowdStrike has the server in Ukraine. There's the server. Um, it actually doesn't mean much because all they did was they um, CrowdStrike, the company that went in to investigate the hack on the DNC, just imaged the, ser um, imaged the server, gave the FBI imaging. That's pretty standard practice, but um, I do feel bad for CrowdStrike. 
here was their, their piece the other day. We were founded in California. We have nothing to do with Ukraine. <laughs> Suggestions to the contrary are completely false. We've never had physical possession of the DNC server. We conducted our investigation using a process called imaging. It's gotten crazy. And I think I, I highlight this just because it's very important um, particularly in the space when attribution is very difficult, when getting behind some of these attacks is very difficult, when getting behind what the organization structure at these nation states in terms of who's behind these attacks. Very important that we not engage in conspiracy theories. And this one really was probably the worst. Um, so, Here's my, we're doing this too, thing that we did in the United States in retaliation for the Russian cyber attacks. Um, we didn't just do sanctions, we didn't just do indictments in the Mueller report. We actually made a point of loudly attacking Russia's power systems too. And um, basically what we did was Cyber Command, which is a, a division of the Pentagon that can conduct cyber attacks, um, had started over the past two years uh, doing things we had not done before. So we had always um, monitored Russian systems for espionage, but now we were sort of making a show of it to say, hey, you hacked our power systems and our nuclear facilities, we can do that too. Um, we did this story at the Times. We learned about the program. My colleague David, David Sanger and I went to the National Security Council and told them what we knew, and we said, do you have any problem with us publishing this story? And they said no. And what that told us was that they actually probably wanted this out there. They wanted uh, it out in the public discourse that we were also inside Russia's systems, and if they were going to do anything to us, we could just do anything back to them. But unfortunately, oh, I don't have my slide. Oh. Fortunately, I was going to have the one of the president calling us out for treason for this story. <laughs> I don't know where that slide went, but you would have seen his tweets. So this story ended up having um, uh, quite a causing quite a ruckus. Um, the president called David and I out for treason and, and oh called us the enemy of the people. Um, it caused our publisher to publish an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal saying that this rhetoric had gotten much too crazy and that journalists are now facing more threats than ever before around the world. Um, and we're still uh, dealing with the, the fallout from this story, but I did want to point that out, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so now I just want to get to the election. So. Um, one of the biggest questions I get now is, what about the election? And if this presentation felt dizzy, that was on purpose. My life has been very dizzy for the last 10 years. I have been jumping from attack to attack, from nation state attack, nation state attack, including our own. Oh, that's, that's nice. Yeah, yes, um, <laughs> and, you know, even if I knew everything I needed to know about cybersecurity back in 2010, it really would not have mattered. Because the threat landscape is changing so quickly that as soon as you think you know one thing, oh, I know, oh it might be me. Okay. Um, it's the Russians. Um, as soon as you think you know, <laughs> this is the Russians. This is a part of the presentation. Um, I forgot to tell you guys that after I did the UAE story about the Toe Talk app, my light on my computer went green on the webcam. Oh. I'd, already, I'd always put tape on that thing to keep anyone from looking at me. And uh, I just recently decided it was too paranoid and to take it off. And it went green. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I lost my train of thought. What I was going to say was that it, it has been very dizzy, and I feel like I'm constantly hopping from crisis to crisis, and the only common thread is that things just keep escalating. People learn a lot from the previous attack. People like to sometimes think about, in terms of solutions, about uh, perhaps applying the same kind of deterrence theory that we use for nuclear weapons, 
but one of the things I learned was cyber weapons are not nuclear weapons. In many cases, they're not cyber weapons. They're just hacking tools that we use for espionage. And you know, for nuclear weapon, you need fissile material to work. In cybersecurity, you just need a misplaced one or zero or a misconfigured video conferencing system or someone who didn't put the firewall up or didn't change the default password on the um, super uh, crazy nuclear computer computers that control the rotors at a nuclear facility. I mean, all you need is weigh in and then you need code that can do whatever you want to do, whether it's spinning a nuclear centrifuges out of control, which was the big badass thing that we in Israel did to an Iranian nuclear facility, um, or whether it's what Russia um, is sort of pre prepared in essence to do to our systems. They've already gotten into these systems. It would just be a matter of using code um, to turn some of these systems off. They've already done that in Ukraine. The question in the United States, one of the things that um, has almost kept us secure is that our systems are so complicated. We use so many different pieces of software, so much old software, that to actually pull off a power uh, grid attack at scale would be fairly complicated, not because we're secure, but just because we're sort of a mess. Uh, um, but. One of the things where we are now is, you know, what about the election? So what about 2020? Where are we at in 2020? So my colleagues and I did a story just exploring the landscape, and what we learned was that there, of the two groups that hacked the DNC, Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear, Cozy Bear had really dropped off the radar. We don't know what they're doing right now. Um, they basically abandoned their hacking infrastructure. We haven't seen a major Cozy Bear attack or even any kind of um, surveillance over the last six months. Um, the IRA, who was behind some of the troll army and in, in, uh, was the troll army in 2016, they've abandoned a lot of their previous email accounts and social media accounts, and they're using things like Proton Mail, anonymous email to communicate. And so we don't know what they're doing. Um, Fancy Bear just hacked <laughs> Burisma which is the country, or sorry, the company at the heart of the impeachment hearings, the one that Hunter Biden served on the board of, um, the one that uh, the administration has called for or pressured Ukraine to conduct investigations in. And as the impeachment hearings were ramping up, I learned that um, Russian hackers had bored into or were spear phishing and successfully spear phishing the company uh, Barista. And what I think this might be, although we really don't know, we don't know how far they got into the systems, we don't know what emails they got. Um, what this is, though, is a cookie cutter, it looks like a cookie cutter attack, like the, DN the hack of the DNC that we saw um, back in 2015 and 2016. So, um, you know, heads up that <laughs> this election's going to be very ugly and we're already <coughs> starting to see the beginning stages of um, what we saw in 2016. And the sad reality is we are not any more secure than we were in 2016. So social media companies have never been under more pressure to deal with the threats from fake accounts and disinformation and propaganda um, DHS is very well aware of some of the threats that could happen to this election. They're performing cyber hygiene assessments at state and local county official systems all over the country, although some of those are voluntary and it has to be up to the states and counties to do so. Um, but other than that, we are still very much woefully underprepared and I think we all just caught a glimpse of that <laughs> in Iowa. You know, here we were using an untested app to report the results from the Iowa caucuses for all the attention that's been paid to the Iowa caucuses for months. No one actually paid attention to the software they were going to use to report the votes. And fortunately, they had a paper trail. You know, fortunately, people were putting their preferences on paper. Um, fortunately, it wasn't an attack. But, you know, as Bobby put it earlier, it was like a natural disaster that showed us and showed other nation states just how vulnerable we still are um, to many of these attacks. So with that, I was going to say some high-minded things on where we are, but I might just open it up to questions. I think 
the main thing I wanted to say is I'm not trying to sort of scare the bejesus out of you. Um, it's just that I think it's very important for us to understand the vulnerabilities. It's very important for us to understand the escalation that with every cyber attack, those attacks can be reverse engineered down to the very bit and understood and built back up and retrofitted against the enemy. So in this case, we've seen that with Iran, with North Korea, with, with Russia, learning um, just how effective that Sony attack was when they dumped emails and using that in the, that tactic in the 2016 election. Um, that it's so important for us to just get our own stuff together um, and really focus on the basics, which is securing our code, securing our systems, running our software updates, so that we're knocking off at least like this mess, um, because we are up against uh, a situation in 2020 where it's not just Russia that wants to interfere in our elections. They really did offer a playbook to every other nation state out there. And I could encourage you to read a story today. It's a story we have in the Times by my colleague about um, the Falun Gong, which is a Chinese spiritual group that has been long oppressed by Beijing, um, that are spending now $2 million a week or so on YouTube ads for pro-Trump YouTube ads. Um, and if you connect the dots, I assume it's because maybe they see the Trump administration as their last vote <coughs> um, because it's it's taken such a strong, chance, a strong stance against China. But um, what it showed us is it's not just nation states anymore. Anyone, whether it's a spiritual group, you know, that has any incentive to impact the election, they have a playbook for, for how to do that now. And, and we're starting to see the very beginnings of them actually doing that. So with that, I just uh, will open it up to questions. like you've had a lot of impact with the coverage that you've provided in driving change in this sector. How have you processed that? How do you feel about it? There's um, no time to process. It's just on to the next <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I'm just like really interested in your response to, or like whether you feel like somebody else should be doing that. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm really proud of the impact our work has had. Um, when I, when I was hired at the Times, there was no other cybersecurity reporter working from Silicon Valley. And so a lot of the threats that we see, the tech companies see first. And so I was able to develop a source base there. Um, and then I'd work with Washington and then increasingly more in Washington. Um, I don't know though if I've had the impact I need to have for us to have some of the conversations, not just in policy circles, but at the dinner table mm -hmm. about how to lock up these systems and just how vulnerable we are. You know, if anything, you know, if you could sum this up, it's that the United States is still, thank God, the most sophisticated cyber superpower on earth. We are. We, we, we caught a glimpse of that in the Snowden documents. I caught a glimpse of that in my reporting and we're good. But in terms of defense, we are now the most vulnerable nation on earth. We've plugged in and automated and web enabled more of our systems than any other country on earth. When I was in Ukraine, you know, they've been subject to some of the most destructive attacks now from Russia, but the one thing that saved them is they're not that advanced in terms of how connected their systems are. And so, um, you know, but they kept telling me, like, you realize if this attack had happened where you are, it would be a lot worse. It's like, I know. That's why my book's called This Is How They Tell Me The World Ends. <laughs> but I didn't really answer your question. I, I don't, I'm not processing it. It's, there's so much here. And I think that's part of the problem. It's all happening so fast um, that it is really hard to, to process until you get to come to UT for a week and someone gets to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. Um, there's a handful of us who are here today who are taking an uh, emerging defense technologies course. And we read recently about the distinction between imitation and innovation when it comes to defense or any other sort of like military technology. 
So imitation being, you know, how do you reverse engineer a technology that another nation state has, and innovation being, you know, how do states just generate their own new military techniques? Um, but this is, it's got to be really different with um, digital technologies and cyber technologies. So I'm wondering, with sort of the usual suspects, what do you see more of, imitation or, or innovation, when it comes to cyber technology? Well. I don't think, you know, if you think of Stuxnet, which I totally skipped over, um, but Stuxnet was the worm that the U.S. and Israel used on the Iranian uh, Natanz nuclear facility to spin their centrifuges out of control. Mm -hmm. the, the guy who first called out the U.S. and Israel and first really dissected that worm is a guy named Ralph Langner in Germany. Um, he has a TED talk that's excellent about Stuxnet that I would recommend you looking at. And I talked to him the other day and he said, I, I can't believe we haven't had a Stuxnet yet, you know, and we don't know why. We, we went back and forth to talk about that. And um, I only bring that up because we didn't need, you know, of these other countries, they didn't need a Stuxnet. They are able to do so much with basic commodity malware, like the Iranian attack on Saudi Aramco, the North Korea attack on, on Sony. Those were basically just a slight adjustment on what's available on the dark web. Um, and so, you know, in terms of innovation or imitation, they're all just, every attack has sort of imitated the last, at least the ones that have come from countries like Iran and North Korea. But like I said, you know, they all have these little twists, and the twists are not uh, technically more sophisticated. It's just that they're, really um, able to hone in on what I think is America's biggest weak spot, which is our own sort of partisan divisiveness, our own um, you know, undermined faith in institutions and the press. Um, they've really, I, I, I don't even know if Russia realized just how successful some of that disinformation in 2016 was going to be. Um, and so I, I wouldn't call that like a, I guess it's an innovation. Um, but I think it's not like they set out to say, we're going to really throw fire on American partisanship and, and the just total obliteration of civil discourse. I think that they hit on something that now they've shown the world, like here's, here's where America's at the weakest. If the, uh, the company that made the app for the Iowa caucuses they had an offer from DHS to review the code and take a look at it, and they turned them down. Now, one of the questions I would have from your perspective is, have we become so divisive and so political in our environment that we're actually becoming our own worst enemy and we're allowing this stuff to create uh, opportunities? Yes, yes, you put it so well. That's. I need you to write that down. <laughs> the, yes, that's exactly what it is. I mean, I was shocked after 2016, I went and looked at uh, North Carolina. So North Carolina, um, Durham, they had a bunch of issues on election day, and they used the e-poll book check-in systems made by a company called VR Systems that had been hacked by Russia. And when people showed up in the, at the polls in Durham in 2016, they were being told that they weren't registered or they needed to go somewhere else. And, um, you know, I wrote this story about, like, is this an attack? And the North Carolina still didn't turn over, their Secretary of State didn't turn over their systems for a forensic analysis until a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that had to do with this distrust between the state and, and counties and the federal government. Now, that was, that, that was, um, that was, they were Republican, and so they they were distrustful of in the immediate aftermath of the Obama administration, but they were still distrustful even when the Trump administration took over, and we only found out a month ago, okay, so now we're like less than a year into the next election, that actually it was technical errors that were to blame. It wasn't some kind of Russian malfeasance, but the fact it took three years, and in the meantime there were all these questions and we weren't gonna to get to the bottom of it because we didn't trust each other. Um, I think says a lot about the fact we are our own worst enemy. We're so ill-equipped to deal with this threat. Um, and, yeah. But I do need you to write that down. 
<laughs> it's, it's like a book title, Our Own Worst Enemy. It's really, it's really true in this domain. Are there any commonly understood rules of behavior that yeah. certain systems will not be subject to cyber attacks because of the possibility of a retaliatory, uh, you know, a similar attack, such as on a nation's air traffic control system? Mm -hmm. Are there any mm -hmm. ideas like that floating in the international community? Yes, thank you. So. Um, there's not enough is the short answer and the there's not very much accountability and um, there's there's a lot of debate about whether the terms are accurate but one of the um, you know we, we thought a lot before we did the Stuxnet attack about whether we were violating the laws of armed conflict and uh, if you go back and look at the Stuxnet attack you can see lawyers' hands all over that code. It was clear they made sure that they weren't just gonna attack any um, computer, industrialized computer system. They were looking for the uh, computer system that specifically controlled the Natanz nuclear um, centrifuges. So the US has been very careful, um, I think because they're, they're worried about uh, the laws of armed conflict. Other countries, no. You know, Russia, they, they sent out this attack against Ukraine that not only hit Ukraine, it hit uh, Merck, it hit Pfizer. It took, um, a bit, it's, I think it, the, the cost is now up to a billion dollars for those companies. They had, to, they had to take vaccines off the market because it froze some of their manufacturing capabilities. And I think with every new attack, we're seeing just how few, few rules there are um, in cyberspace. Now, in terms of what is being discussed, so, in the U.S., sorry, in Europe, in the U.S., there's the Bo Bosnar Treaty um, against that tries to control weapon sales and, and dual-use technology like radar systems or anything that could be used by civilian and military. And a couple of years ago, they tried to add um, in, uh, spyware to to those um, to that treaty, and it's a voluntary, non-binding arrangement. So the idea is. They come up with these control lists and then every country uh, that belongs to this, this treaty, and I think there's 42 of them and the United States is one of them, will go back and create their own domestic laws um, against selling spyware. Now, a lot of the European countries actually went and did that and in European Parliament, they're trying to come up with um, a stronger set of rules around spyware, and cyber weapons and intrusion uh, software. The U.S. has never put that, uh, put those rules into domestic law. They tried at one point to put it into the framework, regulatory framework at the um, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, but um, they they failed because we don't want to be handcuffed. The United States doesn't want to be handcuffed when it comes to using some of these capabilities. Um, we have an amazing exploitation and espionage framework and we sort of see any of any of these rules um, as something that would hinder our, our our capabilities and even if Russia or China were to agree to these rules they use so many proxies to conduct their cyber attacks that they can say they can always say it wasn't us it was this Russian cyber criminal group or in China it was this contractor, we have nothing to do with them, they're just some engineers at Tencent. And so I think we're really, re we do play by the rules for the most part here in the United States. I think we're really reticent to agree to any rules because we fear that some of these other nation states would never play by them. Mm -hmm. There have been other ideas, like Brad Smith, the president at Microsoft has brought up the idea of a digital Geneva convention um, where we would at least set rules for um, what we do with vulnerabilities when we find them and that we wouldn't use them on civilian systems um, or we wouldn't use them in, uh, unless we were at war. And I think everyone thinks it's a wonderful idea, but I think people think the impl implementation and accountability around it would be so complicated that I think it'll be years before we get something like that. But at least people are proposing these things. I mean, things have gotten so bad and I do think, you know, in the U.S. we have a tendency to wait for the disaster to make rules, and I think we're we're teetering on disaster here, you know. But um, we, you know, I, I leave it to you all to think through these things and think through some of the 
potential p policies together with some of the, the technical realities um, to come up with, with some solutions. So in, in one of our courses, we spend a lot of time talking about the Computer Fraud Abuse Act and constraints it puts in place about not leaving your own network boundaries and getting into someone else's network, even if you're the victim and someone outside your network is attacking you. And so then we end up talking about hack that, the, mm -hmm. the possibility that maybe one solution is to empower the private sector, let the JP Morgans of the world fight back. Mm -hmm. In your reporting, have you ever encountered any strong evidence that in fact people are indeed doing this, just trying not to get caught because it yeah. might be illegal? I love the, uh, the idea of the hack back. It sounds so cool, but <laughs> the reality is, like let's take North Korea. There was some, um, there were some people in the administration at the time, uh, and there were some uh, who, who wanted to do a hack back after Sony. And a part of the big problem was their hackers were in China. So who do you hack back? You hack back China, and then what happens? <laughs> then you open this whole can of worms. Um, same with, uh, I think it was JP Morgan that got hacked, and there, there was some discussions there, but nothing ever came of it. I mean, the things that I've heard of that I think are really interesting aren't really hackbacks, but um, you know, so much of the blueprints around the stealth bomber were getting stolen by China a couple years ago. And so there were ideas of like putting up a folder that was like stealth bomber blueprints, <laughs> and then you know putting up blueprints that were riddled with problems and holes. But then there was some talk in the legal circles about, well, if they use those and the plane crashes, are we subject to some kind? Of, I mean, it gets so complicated so quickly. But I love the the idea of it, and I, I don't I don't think it'll ever become something that we permit companies and breach victims to do, but it would be cool if it worked. So within the intelligence community, work to pinpoint real attribution has always been a technical problem, as in, can you be sure that it was that particular organization <coughs> or that computer from which the attack started? And no, you can't. Um, so there are so many cops. There's so, so much uh, confusion and dispersion of the information about where it started that you can't be sure that you're actually hacking back into mm -hmm. the source. Right. You seem to know your stuff here. <laughs> well, it's, but it's true. I mean, they and and you know we're rout, they're routing these their attacks through sensors and servers all over the globe. A lot of them are compromised servers here in the United States. Um, so even if you do pinpoint it, then the problem is here in the United States, you know, we rely on cyber command to do our attacks and we rely on the NSA to do a lot of the exploitation. Um, <coughs> and you could potentially route those back to those agencies, but in, in these other countries, now in Iran, they borrowed the China model. They rely on security companies, which are basically just front companies to conduct their attacks, and they've located them around the globe. They're not just in Tehran anymore. Same with China, same with uh, North Korea. And so it, it really, I mean, the attribution is so difficult, and unfortunately, it really is more art than science. And whenever I write these stories, like when I did the story the other week about Burisma getting hacked, I just got like pillared on Twitter because everyone's like, how do you know? You know, how do you know it's this? And it's like, well, you look at one digital crumb, you don't know. But if you look at these things in totality, you get to a place where you're 99% sure it's Fancy Bear. And, um, you know, to conduct an attack, really, I think the only ones that have the level of intelligence to be able to say with 100% certainty that it is who it is, is the NSA. And to your point about us being our own worst enemy, even when, for the very first time, the President of the United States got on television and said it was North Korea that hacked Sony, and we wrote about this, we were getting called out each and every day and beat up for saying we were the new Judy Millers, the head of the Iraq WMDs, just buying the government's line, hook, line, and sinker. There was so much distrust that we couldn't even agree on who had done it, even as they were just, you know, had just wrecked us, so it's like a real problem. Mm -hmm. I, I'll take one more. Uh, maybe quick. Um, so the post reported that Ben Hubbard might also have been targeted by NSO on behalf of the Saudis. 
how do you think about uh, sort of reporter cybersecurity, like reporter device cybersecurity or newsroom cybersecurity in the face of threats like that? Is that something that the Times can do on its own with like Aruna's team? Or Aruna got fired. Um, Aruna was our newsroom security guru, but we have like 12 people doing what she was doing. So the, the answer is that because I know so much, I don't, I never think we're doing enough on this. I think like, it's kind of funny that my green light went on the other day after the tow truck story, but not really, you know? And I just try to do better than anyone at keeping my most sensitive conversations off my devices completely. But, um, you know, it's a problem. When I was doing that Mexico story about NSO group, um, that spyware being used, uh, awesome who I was doing the stories with was like I got the message too and my phone was acting weird I actually just sold it to someone because you know. and uh, I'm like I don't know should I be like offended I didn't get the message but maybe they think I'm so smart I you know, picked it up but um, no I mean we are real targets now you know China attacked us because they were looking for my colleague David Barbosa's sources for a story he'd done on the Chinese ruling elite um, and I think newsrooms really have to wake up to this. Now the good news is we do we are aware. We do have people working with, with reporters on these things. Probably not enough, um, but we're probably very lucky at the New York Times to have lawyers and security gurus and technical team that I don't know if other news organizations can afford. Um, so that's something I'm really worried about. I, I don't know if I have the slide in here, but you know, Ahmed Mansour, the guy in the UAE who they found all the spyware, after I did that story, he's now in solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. um, and the last time I interviewed him, he said, you know, this is no way to live. My, they know everything I'm saying. They're basically sitting here in my living room with me. They're making sure I can't get a job. They've taken away my passport so I can't go anywhere. They've taken away my kids' ability to get jobs. Mm -hmm. like, this is the power of the surveillance state. And the reason I think we're focusing so much on the UAE be is because that's what the surveillance state looks like at its worst by a country that's an American ally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I, I hope people are paying attention to that because we're only, we're, we're not that far away from that. I'm, I'm not saying the US government is going to do that, but I think we're not that far away from, from that surveillance state, and so. On that joyful note, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much.